talk about segmenting, targeting, and positioning. And I wanted to start by showing you a commercial for a product. And when we started the class, we talked about these ideas of marketing, these philosophies of marketing beginning with the production era, which the mentality or the motto, as you might recall, and so this could be a test question again because it sort of all builds on each other, the motto or the takeaway from the production era of marketing or the production philosophy could be what? Summed up as what? What one line? If what? If you build it, they will come. That we can produce products for a homogenous society and go out and sell them. And the, the Model T was a, a wonderful example of that. And so here's an example, I think, in the modern era or the contemporary era of a product that tries to do all things to all people and focuses on this production mentality. And I'm not sure that it's an effective marketing uh, strategy. So it's called the Forever Lazy. It's a onesie. <laughs> How many of you remember onesies from when you were a kid? How many of you had a onesie when you were a kid? Did your onesies have feet with them? Oh, yeah. Did you like the feet? Anybody want a onesie now? A few of you? Gene Simmons, rock god, wears a onesie. Anybody of you know? Gene Simmons, I know that's not of your era. It's of mine. I'm dating myself. Who's Gene Simmons? Yes. Yes, yeah, right? The, um, the devil, he's got a really long tongue. He wears a onesie. How many of you have watched his reality TV show, Family Jewels? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. So this is a, a commercial for a modern onesie. On lazy days when it's chilly, turning up the heat costs money, and wrestling with blankets is silly. This one's too big, that one's too small, and a blanket can't cover it all. If you want to stay warm, you need Forever Lazy. The one-piece, lie-around, lounge-around, full-body lazy wear that covers you from head to toe in soft, warm fleece. Just slip it in, zip it, and get lazy. Now you're toasty warm from head to toe, and your hands and feet stay free, so you can talk on the phone, enjoy a good book, do homework, or just do nothing at all. Forever Lazy is made of ultra-soft, breathable fleece, and it's oversized for that baggy, comfortable, lazy day, perfect pajama feeling you love. Party it up with friends, or enjoy some down to the back, and do it all while staying warm, comfortable, and lazy. Forever Lazy comes in four stylish colors, in sizes to fit everyone in the family, so you can all watch the big game together, while Dad does what he does best. Whether you're bathing the fridge during a commercial break, or cramming for a college exam, Forever Lazy keeps you comfy cozy. With a drawstring hoodie to keep the chilly weather away, Forever Lazy is the best way to stay warm outdoors. It will be the top of your next tailgate, and you'll stay warm and comfortable through the entire game. Uh-oh, gotta go? No worries. Forever Lazy has different hatches in front and back for great escapes with me. Forever Lazy in any size is just $19.95. But wait, call now, and we'll also include the fleece hoodies to keep your toes toasty warm. The hoodies are a $10 value, but they're yours free. Order now and we'll send you the Forever Lazy inflatable neck pillow. Great for home, travel, or just being lazy. It's a $10 value, but it's yours free. Just pay processing and handling. You get the Forever Lazy, the footies, and the neck pillow, all for just $19.95. Here's how to order.
uh, football game or the OU football game in one of these, wouldn't it just scream lunatic no. to you? <laughs> and you think it would be perfectly fine? It scream that he is forever lazy. It would scream that he is forever lazy. So this is, a, you know, this is an attempt to make a product for everybody. And the truth of the matter is that once we get out of that sort of pre-industrial and industrial revolution, early industrial revolution, we start to realize that populations are not so homogenous. There's lots of differences, and so we're not all going to settle, and we've talked about this before, for the same product. We have lots of different needs. And so in the current era, if we engage in value co-creation, we're going to have to focus on how we can find those segments that are going to be the most responsive to our marketing message. Those segments that will positively react. So we can divide the population up into relatively homogenous sectors that may respond similarly to our marketing message. They have similar needs and wants and will respond similarly. So how are we going to break the market up? Well, there are easy ways to break it up and there are more difficult ways to break it up. So what are some of the easiest ways, according to your text, of breaking up the, the, the market? What's probably the easiest way? It's one that relies on, as we go back and you think about our marketing research, you can use secondary data to do it. How can we do this? What can we break the market up into? An easy, easy way to do it. Didn't read the check. I have a colleague who will just ask a question and then he'll sit there and wait. And eventually somebody will answer. I've watched him sit there as long as 30 minutes for someone to respond. It becomes uncomfortable. So what's the easiest way to break a, a market up into segments? Okay, what is that called? What's that? Demographics, right? We can get this information from the Census Bureau. Age. Gender. Are different age groups going to need similar products? Yeah? As you get older, as I get older, what, what kinds of things appeal to people that are getting older? What kinds of products can you market to them? Reading glasses. Reading glasses. Forever lazy. Maybe, maybe as we get older we want uh, forever lazy. Yeah. For a large sector of the population, as you age, one of the things that happens is you become maybe less myopic and you have a more difficult time reading things up close. And so Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, invented glasses to deal with this. But it's something that most people your age don't have to wear. It's called what? Bifocals or readers. I am fortunate enough that I am so myopic that I've, I've gotten to the point where even though I'm 45 years old, I don't have to have readers because I've never had the laser eye. My, my optometrist kept trying to get me to do the laser eye surgery, and the idea of them shooting lasers into your eyeballs just didn't really appeal to me. And as a lawyer, I had a client who sued one of the companies here in town that does that because they messed it up. And they don't tell you what the real risk is. There's about a 5% risk that if they strip your vision, that you're always going to be looking through a dirty shower curtain when they do the laser eye correction. So I never did it because I had done, I worked on this case with this client who had sued them. And as a result, because I've been so myopic, my really close up vision is still really, really good and I don't have to have readers. So as you get older, you have to have readers. What else can we, what other kind of characteristics in terms of demographics can we age? Gender, are there different needs for uh, men and women? Yes. Okay, in terms of what? What? Taste and preferences and clothing, things like that. So we can, we can do that. These are very easy ways to do it. Uh, ethnicity, we can figure that out very easy. Again, you can use secondary data. Now, this is not necessarily all that wonderful of a way to segment, but if you don't have a lot of marketing, research resources, it can be 
uh, an effective way, I guess, of, of somewhat getting an idea, income level, education, things like that, those basic things that we get from the, the uh, Census Bureau. What's another way that we can segment populations up that's very easy to do? What, who said it? Where they live. Where you live, absolutely. Geographic segmentation is an enormously important way to segment. There are lots of things that we offer in Oklahoma for sale that, for example, they don't offer in other places for sale. When I was getting my PhD at New Mexico State, they had done a survey of fifth graders in New Mexico. Did I tell you all this story? They'd done this survey of fifth graders in New Mexico, and one of the questions that they asked them is where they were most likely to see a boat. And do you know what kids overwhelmingly wrote down on their responses to where they were most likely to see a boat in New Mexico? On the highway. That's what they said, on the highway. Why? New Mexico is a what? Desert, dry state, not a lot of water. And so if you ask kids in Oklahoma, where are you most likely to see a boat? What would they say? The lake. The lake. Because that's what we have here. We have lots of lakes, right, that are man-made. They're kind of dirty and uh, clay bottom, but we have lots of them. And we're more likely to see a boat. So they don't sell a whole lot of boats in New Mexico. I have a 36-foot uh, Regal Commodore Captain Cruiser boat on uh, the river in Muskogee, at the port of Muskogee, called Three Forks Harbor. And you don't see that kind of boat in New Mexico at all because there's not a lake that's really even big enough to hold that, that type of boat. And so we have market a lot of boats, jet skis, things like that. What will they market in New Mexico that we don't market in Oklahoma? Ski. Ski. We don't have any what? Mountains. We don't have any mountains here. Does that prevent you from skiing? Well, not necessarily. You can still do cross country and in states where they have a lot of snow but no mountains, they sell cross-country skis, but we don't even sell those in Oklahoma because we don't have a lot of what? We don't have a lot of snow. How many days a year would skis be effective in Oklahoma? Uh, maybe, maybe December and January, maybe one or two days a year. I have seen years in Oklahoma, as long as I've lived here, that we had no snow the entire year. So we're not gonna market a whole lot of skis in Oklahoma, there's one store that sells ski equipment in Oklahoma, and it's for people who are going where? Oh, to New Mexico or Colorado. It's called Sun and Ski Sports. It's on May Avenue. But we don't have a lot of those. We have a lot of, if you're going to market skis in Oklahoma, they're going to be what kind of skis? Water, water skis. And you'll find those at, at Wakeboard and water ski shops and things like that. So we can, uh, we can break the market up in terms of geographic regions. There are lots of different things that we like in Oklahoma that they don't like in other places. I think I told you all that in New York, for example, it's almost impossible to find a restaurant that serves biscuits and gravy. I was so thrilled when I visited my brother one summer and we went to the racetrack for the morning workouts at Saratoga Springs, which is the oldest racetrack in the nation. And they allow you to go out and they have breakfast served and you can watch the morning workout of the horses that are going to run that day, and it's a really pretty event. It's nice and cool. Saratoga, unlike Oklahoma, you sit out on this patio at the racetrack. And unlike Oklahoma, there's not a lot of bugs or a lot of heat, so you can actually sit out there and watch. And they were serving, I was thrilled, this, uh, this racetrack was serving, the racetrack restaurant was serving biscuits and gravy because a lot of the horses and a lot of the trainers that come in for the races in Saratoga actually bring their horses in from what's a big horse racing state? Probably the biggest in the country. Kentucky, which is a southern state. So they were serving biscuits and gravy to, to take care of this demographic. And they had made the gravy with turkey gravy. It was not exactly a wonderful experience. But you get other than the racetrack, you couldn't even find biscuits and gravy up there. So geographic preferences play a role. Um, maybe one of the most important ways is to go with psychographics. So we have the VAL survey. You all should log on and take the VAL's uh, survey and see what type you are. And this comes up with different, uh, by, based on your responses, 
to the survey, it comes up with different preferences based on behavioral or psychographic surveys. So they have these types, innovators, thinkers, believers, achievers, strivers, experiencers, makers, and survivors. So innovators are confident, they're willing to experiment, they are oftentimes what we call early adopters of technology. So for example, I had friends when the first iPhone came out that were right there and the first ones in line to get the iPhone. And I said to them, you know, the price will fall. And sure enough, in three months, the price of the iPhone had fallen because technology generally has gotten cheaper in most respects as we've gone on. And I said, was it worth it to be the first one to have the iPhone? And they said, yes, it was. It was, it was absolutely worth it to them. They are early adopters. They like experiments. They're uh, future oriented. They uh, believe in science and research and development. They enjoy the challenge of problem solving and have a variety of interests and activities. So they are generally attracted to high tech gadgets and things like that. And they're more willing to take those kinds of risks and be early adopters. Thinkers have ought and should benchmarks for social conduct, a uh, tendency towards analysis, paralysis. That might be me. I talked to you about my development of the book, right? Every time I want to make a major purchase, I start developing the notebook and looking and researching. Enjoy historical perspectives, are financially well off generally, are not necessarily influenced by what's hot as evidenced by my response to my friends. I was not the first one to run out and buy the iPhone. And the only real reason I really wanted the iPhone was because it would connect to my camera very easily and allow me to uh, record classes more easily. Um, we use technology in functional ways, uh, refer to traditional intellectual, in, uh, intellectual pursuits and proven products. We'll just do a couple more of these. Believers believe in basic rights and wrongs. This is a big segment in Oklahoma. We have a tendency to believe that we know what's right, what's patriotic, right? Believe in uh, spiritual and faith inspiration. We are one of the most spiritually and religiously oriented states. We have more churches in many of our communities than they have in many other places. For example, in my hometown in Guthrie, we have, I think, something like 25 Baptist churches alone. So there's all different kinds of varieties of Baptists, and you can choose which you want. Um, not looking to change society, find legitimate sources of information, value consistency and stability. At the very bottom, you have survivors. These are cautious, risk adverse are usually the oldest consumers. They're thrifty, maybe on a limited budget, not concerned about appearing traditional, uh, appearing trendy. They take comfort and routine. Heavy TV viewers, how are you going to get your products? How are you going to find out about products for most of you? What's new and what's hot? The internet. The internet. You're going to get your information from the internet and from your peer group. These people still watch television. It's one of the reasons that television ads are still so important, particularly in presidential politics, which we'll talk about in just a minute, an example of how to segment with some of my research. Um, they're the least likely to use the internet and most likely to have a landline only household, to not have a cell phone, lots of people. Or if they have a cell phone, it's very basic. I have a friend like this, he keeps telling me he wants me to ask Google as if Google is a person, you know, that I can go to and ask the answers. Because he's got this old kind of flip phone that uh, he basically just uses for emergencies. So psychographics are an important way and a much more rich way of breaking up our our segments into uh, into useful categories for markers. There's also behavioral. Now, 
in my own research, one of the things that I've looked at, and what I'm going to ask you to do for today's critical thinking challenge, is to think about these theories that I've used to segment a, a market and to apply them then to a product or service marketplace. So we're coming into a presidential election year, and there's lots of candidates that have filed in the Republican field, and in the Democratic field, it was limited to two, but it looks like Joe Biden might actually enter the race. And so one of the papers that I wrote that got published focuses on three theories of political science, and I think you can apply these theories to maybe the marketplace as well, and so I'm going to ask you to think about these, and how could you use these to segment the market in uh, a product or service market. So there are these theories from political science that we have borrowed, and marketing as a new discipline has oftentimes borrowed theories from other disciplines, from sociology, economics, political science, in relating to markets. And so there are, in terms of electoral politics, we have something called classical democratic theory. I don't know why people put markers back. It don't work. You might need to throw that one away. When you go to the box, and there's never a marker that works. So we have this idea of classical democratic theory. Now what classical democratic theory says is that in the political marketplace, voters' preferences should be turned into law. And that in America, as the classic example of this, we do that. We have elections, and we elect representatives to the United States House of Representatives, and senators to the United States Senate and a president, and they go to Washington and they hash out the, the, their ideas, and it's turned in, it's a reflection of our citizens' preferences, and it's turned into law. And classical democratic theorists would say our constitutional structure allows us to do this. So you might think of this as the broad umbrella approach to politics, that everybody's opinion matters. We go to the polls, we express our opinion in those polls, and those polls are turned into public policy. Now, in reaction to this theory, there's an antithetical theory that is called elite theory. And elite theory says that it's actually not the way things happen. Elections come and go, but the elite stay the same. And the elite are the ones that actually matter in our political system. In this presidential election year, we will spend billions of dollars in advertising to voters to try and persuade them. Because the currency of the political marketplace is the vote. How are you going to get those voters? You have to get on television. Why? Who votes in this country, for the most part? What? It's mostly older people. One of the things that we know is that you will go vote as you get older. Why? You care more, you have a vested interest in it. As you pay more taxes, for example, you might be interested in voting so that you ensure that you're, you're not being uh, taxed into oblivion. You also have a vested interest in terms of Social Security. Ronald Reagan threatened to cut out the top 10% of people from making, put a cap on Social Security income and basically eliminate those people that really didn't need it. Those people went to the polls in droves and voted overwhelmingly against anybody who said that they would support the Reagan proposal for, for that. So elite theorists say that it's really the elite because it costs billions of dollars to run for president now, who has the billions of dollars? Who's writing the checks? Donald Trump has pointed this out in his political speeches, right? He says, vote for me, I'm not beholden to anybody. These other people that are not rich have to go out and solicit money, and they are beholden to their campaign donors. And who are those campaign donors for the most part? They're the old wealthy people, right? They're wealthy people who have a lot of money to go and, and vote. So, 
The first elite theorist is a guy named Charles Beard, and he looks at the Constitution of the United States, and he says the Constitution isn't a political document. It's an economic document. It's an economic document that was written by wealthy people. He does an analysis of the Founding Fathers. Most of them were lawyers. A lot of them owned large parcels of land. They were involved in commerce, and under the Articles of Confederation, they were unable to enforce contracts across state lines. So he says this, this was really an economic document. C. Wright Mills is a more, uh, more recent thinker who talks about the power elite. And one of the things he says is that if you look at three big institutions in the United States, you have government, big business, which I'll abbreviate as BB, and the military. And he says at the top of these institutions, all these people are the same. And they form an interlocking directorate that is mutually beneficial. So government needs a military in order to deal with threats. The military like toys, don't they? What's the saying? Boys love their toys? How many of you love your toys? I love, I love my big truck. I love my horse trailer. I love my big boat. I love my wave runners. I love my, the military is the ultimate toy, isn't it? Lots of fun stuff. And there's this business that supports it. And if you look at the top people, they're oftentimes interchangeable. If you look at the top officials in the military industrial complex, which support the military, and many times you'll find that they are retired generals and admirals that are, uh, that are on the boards of directors or in vice president's roles of these corporations because they understand the military. And these people also fund campaigns for politicians. And so it becomes a mutually, uh, mutually exclusive and beneficial society. There's a third theory called pluralism, which says, well, it's by groups, pluralistic theory. Pluralism says it's through coalition and compromise that groups come to prominence and play a role in our society. And that it's not just wealthy groups that have access to power, it's also other groups, social groups. There are groups for every interest. One of the things that you will do as you get older is you will join more and more groups. You will join societies based on your profession. And these groups will be influential in impacting government policy. And so it's through coalition compromise and through group activity that we can get together. Now, I think if you look at the current political market in terms of segments, what you have is you have Bernie Sanders, who represents the classical democratic theorist. He's out there saying, I'm fighting for the little guy. I want socialism. I believe in socialized medicine. I believe in the social safety net. As a result, he's not got a lot of big businesses that are supporting him. He's trying to appeal and trying to get campaign donations from very small individuals who are donating five and ten and fifteen dollars at a pop. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you have people like Jeb Bush, who has raised millions of dollars from big business and industries that view him as the establishment candidate for the Republican Party. In the middle, you might, for the pluralistic, which is sort of a combination of these two, a synthesis theory, you have Hillary Clinton. She's appealed to a lot of traditional groups to raise money. She hasn't raised all of her money from big donors. She's raised it from things like the NAACP, the AFL-CIO, and small individuals. But she's also raised some money from Wall Street and others. Now, how can we use this model to segment, what can we learn from this to segment the business model? So what I want you to do in your groups is I want you to think about restaurants. How can we apply these models to local restaurants in Oklahoma City? I'll give
give you an example. There's a restaurant at the top of the uh, Devon Tower, right? Uh, what model do you think they're operating on? My friend called, so you can't use this one since I'm giving it to you as an example. My friend called because he wanted to have his birthday celebration there. And they said, well, have you ever eaten with us before? And he said, no. And they said, well, let us tell you about the rules. And they went down this list of rules that they had to eat there. And then they said, and we need an email address so we can email you the rules so that you can eat there. And he said, yeah, thanks, but no thanks, right? So think about restaurants and how we could apply this model. What model is sort of the classical democratic model of restaurants that wants to serve everybody? Now, what restaurant is the elite model? So I'll give you about 10 minutes and we'll come up and see what you come up with in terms of uh, And then think about and also look at this vowels and see what models you think of the vowels would be most attractive to those restaurant types. Okay? So I'll give you about 10 minutes. All right, so which group wants to go first and give their plangent answers to the question, how can we use these three models to segment restaurant customers? Combined with the vowels. You guys want to go first? All right, so let's hear it. Okay, so uh, the first one we got was for the uh, Elite Theory. It's a place called the George. It's in Founders Tower. Uh, it's a high-end steakhouse. It's typically like seventy dollars a steak. Okay. Um, for the pluralistic, we got KDs because they have two menus. One is like an eighty dollars steak to eleven hundred dollar bottle of wine, and the other menu is like ten to fifteen dollar meals. Okay, very good. That's that's a really interesting connection there. All right. And then um, the classical or the Lowe was the Nick's Burgers, because you can get a burger for about 10 bucks over there. Okay. So. Just sell to everybody. Yeah. All right. Very good. That's an interesting response. That's a good good uh, connection there. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. So you're talking about McDonald's when you say Happy Meal, right? All right. Okay, and did you all, I said look at the vowels, did anybody look at the vowels? Okay, let's do yours. Right, wait, what, ma'am? We'll do her and then you, okay. All right. Um, okay, so we did Subway for the classical democratic theory, um, because Subway's slogan is you can have it your way. Right. So it varies among, so we did it like an umbrella for all of them. Okay. That one. And then um, we did Red Rock for the Elite Theory because um, it caters to the conservative business professionals, which the Elite Theory was, they'll always be there. Right. So in Oklahoma, you're always going to have, most of the time, conservative business professionals. Um, and so we put Achievers, Strivers, and Innovators. Okay, very good. That. I and think that's right. The last one we did, Chili's and Applebee's. Um, it's pretty much like a safe bet. You can get anything there. Um, relatively, um, and we put that for as survivors because people that want uh, to know that everyone's going to be happy that's with them, um, they don't really have to take a risk, it's kind of just a go-to place to make everyone happy. So. Okay, very good. Good connections there. I think that's good. Yes, ma'am. Very good connection. Now, with your, with regard to the coach house, it's kind of an establishment, 
restaurants. So do you think that you might get more of the people that like sort of that tradition? You will, but some of the prices and the dress code and stuff is gonna push away people that can't afford to be there. It's gonna be more people that have the money to go. Okay. So All right, very good. Who else wants to go? All right. Okay, very good. I think you got some good connections there. All right, who else? Which other teams need to go? All right. All right, for the uh, classical and the graphic theory, we did uh, Red Robin. Um, because everyone can come there. Um, it's uh, basically, uh, you know, no dress code, of course. So that's one thing that we looked at. For uh, the elite theory, we did Mickey Mouse. Um, you know, pretty much dress code is uh, pretty strict in there and not come dressed up professionally. And also uh, the atmosphere is uh, basically catered towards, you know, very, you know, the dining experience that they really, you know, I know. So, we can now do the LGD theory. And for the last one, the Clueless and Clueless theory, we did the uh, Twin Peaks and Hooters and also Chuck E. Cheese. So, <laughs> oh, wow, we've got, got a real disparity there. Twin Peaks, Hooters, and Chuck E. Cheese. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, so of course, Twin Peaks, you know, it's uh, for the uh, men, young age adults, can come in there and uh, dine and uh, get the experience of the women and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but also Chuck E. Cheese for the kids, you know, mainly for the families and the nature. So. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're uh, a guy that goes to Twin Peaks often, but goes to Chuck E. Cheese as well, I would be kind of. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you. I want to ask you though about your choice. You said something that's interesting about Mickey Mantle. That there's a dress code. Is there an actual dress code of Mickey no, Mantle? No, not one actual dress code. But I would say it's, it basically promotes um, that. You think that it's that? You think it's the social pressure, right? Like yeah. people won't just go in if they if they're just walking around in flip flops and cut off shorts it's and like breakdown. Unspoken rule. You think it's an unspoken rule? Okay, there. Are, there. When when we contacted Bass, when I was growing up as a kid. There were lots of restaurants that actually had dress codes. I mean, strict dress codes, where it was gentlemen had to have a coat and tie, and women could not wear pants. That was that they were strict on that. The country club that we belonged to when I was a kid, in the in the formal dining room, that was the dress code. And I, there are very few people places that actually have that. And so when Vast said, "Well, we need to send you the list of rules," I was kind of like, "Wow, this is this is a step back in time," because most people don't dress up anymore, do they? I mean, very few people actually dress up. Business casual has become sort of the norm. Even among bankers and lawyers were the last holdouts. And even in law firms today, most of the norm is, is just business casual, unless you're a litigator. And it actually has created a lot of tension in law, in law firms because litigators have to wear a coat and tie every single day, and they hate it. And you know, the guys who never go to court are all running around in polo shirts and slacks, and so it's kind of an unfair deal. But I was kind of a, a amazed. There, there used to be actual strict enforced dress codes at a lot of restaurants that we don't have, but I think that there is definitely an informal dress code in a lot of places. Yes, sir? So what if somebody look ambiguous in whatever they wore? What is what? If they look ambiguous no matter what they wore? <laughs> like in the past? You mean, if are you? They were to go to a restaurant like that, um, well, I, I can tell you that we went to, there used to be a, there's still a restaurant, I think that's still in business called The Haunted House. And we went with uh, a woman who wore a pantsuit, which I would think is sort of an ambiguous thing. And this was in 1989, and I can remember they said, we, you, no, no pantsuit. Like, gentlemen, it was coat and tie, and woman, it was dress. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's a different era. We live in a different time than, than we used to. Okay, who else has got? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we set up for the democratic theory. We said something like McDonald's is cheap and everyone can afford it. We also talked about um, that whole 
like the all-day breakfast thing where public demand, like they, they listen to public demand. And then you get to people like the elite theory of mahogany's, and it's just kind of like, we'll do a nice, nice menu because they can afford it, but you don't really get a lot of say in what's on their menu. Right. Um, and then we said pluralistic was chilies, where you have like a nice sit-down experience, but at reasonable prices. Right, it's, it's far more, uh, if you want to have something that's not just fast food, that maybe has some more nutritional value than white bread and a hamburger, you can go to Chili's and get, you can, they do have somewhat of a healthier menu. Although, one of the things, and when we talk about advertising that you should think about, is the deception. And this going along with what Brian Wansink said in his health halo effect. A lot of people will say, you know, look, I'm, I'm eating healthy, I'm having a salad. Well, when the salad is loaded with blue cheese crumbles, uh, you know, buffalo chicken fingers, and a pint of ranch dressing, it, it may not be as healthy as we think it is. Okay, who else? Mm -hmm. You've got great, unique food, um, it's a great price, and you've got a casual environment. So we said experiencers would really like that. And this is for the elite, we did um, Mickey Mouse. It's not really, like we said before, it's not really have a dress code, but it is a little bit more expensive. So maybe people are automatically going to be dressed better because they can afford to be there. And we said the thinkers would probably be the ones most likely to shop there. Okay. So you chose uh, the Paseo. Do you think that, that there may be something, though, in the sale that goes on in terms of kind of the culture that may not necessarily be pluralistic? What's, I mean, what's the Paseo sort of known as? The art district. What does the art, what does the art district appeal more to? You think it's a younger crowd? Who, who can afford to buy art? It's usually, I don't know, although it's a very eclectic mix that you get in the Paseo. You get the artists who may not have a lot of money, all the way up to the guys like John Belch, who basically developed the Paseo, who was a very wealthy attorney, who owned most of the buildings, and now his wife owns uh, the vast majority of them after he passed away, and, and uh, that was about a year ago, I guess. And So yeah, that may be an example of pluralism, where you do have lots of groups in that, in that community that you know, have, or you're marketing different niches. Okay, any other group? Yes, ma'am. So we took a slightly different approach for the classical democratic theory. We chose chilies because it has like a variety of things. So you can sit down with five or six people who all have different tastes and everyone can find something on that menu that they will like. And it's at a very reasonable price. For the elite theory, we chose juniors because it, well, I mean, it's still got like red velvet on the walls. Um, oh, you chose a classical uh, Oklahoma City establishment. How many of you have eat, How many of you know where Juniors is? Just a few of you. It's on Northwest Expressway. It was one of the big oily hangouts in the 1980s. Okay. You don't think it's very good? Okay. All right. They chose a specific like, genre of food, and like that's your only option when you go there. And but it's also very reasonable, so anyone can afford it. So we chose Panera because it's like here you can pick between soup, salad, and sandwich, and then that's kind of it during lunchtime. And then you know they have their bagels for breakfast. Um, so that's the way we kind of interpret it. It was a little bit different than everyone else. But. Okay, I I like that you chose uh, Panera. Nobody's mentioned that. And they are sort of, you know, more uh, of an in-between kind of synthesis. They're, they're fast, right? But it, you don't feel like when you go to Panera that you're eating at McDonald's or Burger King or, you know, Wendy's because of the atmospherics that play a role there, I think. Okay. Do we have any other groups? Yes, sir. All right, so uh, for the classic, uh, the theory, it just shows uh, IHOP, Denny's, places like that, the reasonable prices, uh, variety of foods, and they're really marketable to everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that the survivors could this. Okay. 
Uh, and their advertising sort of reflects that, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. The the value meal, uh, you know, pancake, and what else do they have that they've got? But they were all you can eat pancakes. I think this summer. Okay. All right. Uh, and we, uh, we, chose, we also chose melts and carbs and mantles. Uh, the expensive prices, the, the great quality of the food. Um, we really kind of allowed just like certain kind of customers. And uh, we think that the achievers fit this method. And also for pluralism, we chose like Chinese places like Taste of China. Uh, they have uh, most of their Chinese food based menu. But they also have like an option for like a few options for American food for uh, people who prefer American food over Chinese food. Okay. And we think that the experiencers fit this. Okay. One of the interesting things about uh, Chinese food, I was listening to something on the Food Network the other day, and they were talking about sort of the history and origin of certain things at Chinese restaurants. What's one of the things that they give you at a Chinese restaurant as you leave? A fortune cookie. If you went to China and asked or where the fortune cookies are, they don't have them. Do you know where the fortune cookie originated? It was actually in Japan. It's a, it's a derivative of a Japanese dish. And so it's interesting that they have them at Chinese. And if you go to if you go to a traditional Chinese restaurant in China, they actually don't have fortune cookies. So it's kind of one of those things where we 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 associate things with things that may not actually be so. Yes, sir. The pizza was started in China. It was it was started in where? China. Yeah, I can believe that. All right, we had one other group. Is that yes, sir? Um, for the uh, classical model, we uh, like everyone else selected uh, McDonald's. And their their motto forever and ever was what? Billions and billions served. But for example, you get breakfast all day now, and for the bowels uh, uh, category, we select they pretty much survivors. Okay. In that range there. For the elite uh, models, we chose uh, Mahogany Steakhouse. Uh, they target the upper class, uh, higher income, clients of health, have a dress code and stuff. Okay. Now, a bunch of people mentioned Katie's, and I didn't ask anybody else this question, so I'll ask you. Uh, what are we going to do with Katie's when Kevin Durant gets traded? <laughs> What's going to happen when it gets traded? Yeah, it's actually owned by the Hal Smith Group. So they actually own a bunch. They own Charleston's, Toby Keith's, uh, Mahogany's. Uh, do they own? Huh? Krispy Kreme, the Krispy Kreme franchise. So yeah, it'll probably change. That's so, interesting. Human nature being what it is, we hope that the, that the uh, community doesn't have a negative reaction to the rest to of the world, change. Just because KD goes to wherever he wants to. He said he's Dallas happy here. He said he's happy here, but you know what happens when he's no longer a player? I mean, even if he spends his entire career here, it's one of the things that's a it's a risk in business. To have someone so associated with the with the company that when they're no longer relevant, does it stay? Um, you said you worked at Katie's, is that right? Yeah. You work at Katie's. Do you think Toby Keats will ever go out? They'll ever. Uh, yeah. Like even uh, like the management and Katie's think that Toby Keats is not going to be good because they are not consistent um, and they don't have a lot of. Okay. Just because they like the song, yeah. but how much longer can the song stay relevant, right? I don't know. I mean, music changes and music preferences change so quickly that that, that is a risk. All right. Did we have any other groups? Okay. So 